Hi there, Nick Dutch back on the camera again one more time. Let's talk a bit about scientific methodology for move and I'm taking from the Open Guides to Psychology, Learning to Use Statistical Text in Psychology by Green and Oliveira, and Starting Statistics uh, in Psychology and Education, published in London by Widenfield and Nicholson, 1990, or reprinted 1990, originally printed 1988. Okay, this book, I think it was um, page 5, essentially deals with aspects of the experimental hypothesis and says that the experimental hypothesis is a predictive statement which are used to essentially make a claim that something might happen in the future and you then test the experimental hypothesis with the experiment itself. Okay, um, starting statistics here goes into a bit more detail in some ways but, but not in all ways because this book is much more for actual statistical tests. This book covers the methodology plus the tests, okay? I, it talks about descriptive statistics such as um, counting and labeling basically and then it goes on to inferential statistics which is much more about the predictive power of statistical analysis and how uh, numbers and information can be used to assess a predictive claim. It talks about the different types of data here on page 25, nominal, ordinal and interval plus uh, and ratio data. Uh, nominal also called frequency data and essentially deals with the number of subjects that did one thing or another or fall into a particular category. For instance, if you were to say that there are four women and five men in a room, this is nominal data, seeing as it tells you the frequency of occurrence of instances of the categories of men and women. So that's one particular type of data. Okay? Then there's ordinal data, which is um, ordering data. Which is the results of many, sorry, the results of many sporting events are given in a form of ordinal, sometimes called ranked data. That's ranked with an R, okay? <laughs> if you are told who came first, second, etc., for example, if I say that in the Grand National, Dobbin came first, Nelly came second, and Blue Donkey came third, this is ordinal data. So that's two different types of data which is used in two completely different ways and has different meanings according to science and for scientific purposes. Alright, so you've got to know what type of data you're using before you can actually say that you're actually doing something which is scientific. And then finally it mentions interval and ratio data. Uh, it's, it's a little more complex. It shows how much difference there is between the first and second, the second and the third, etc. value in a particular sequence. So that's a little more complex, okay? Alright, now we've got a little passage defining what an experiment is and how an experiment actually works. An experiment is the study of cause and effects. It differs from simple observation, which I believe is what Thunderfoot was doing, in that it involves deliberate manipulation of one variable, the independent variable. That's what it's called, that's just its name, okay, the, the variable that you actually can control. Whilst controlling other variables, which are called extraneous variables. So they do not affect the outcome uh, in order to discover the effect on another variable, which is called the de uh, dependent variable, which is essentially the resultant variable that you're actually looking at uh, and testing. So essentially the formula for an experiment, a nice little diagram at the top there, don't know whether you can see that, but never mind. Uh, it says here, extraneous variable plus independent variable leads to dependent variable. So the causes are the extraneous variables and the independent variables, and it leads to the effects or the depend dependent variable. Now, if the independent variable, if you can see that there, is the one that you're manipulating, you can have two conditions, condition A and condition B, and you can try and work out which of those two conditions is essentially the one which is bringing about the results, A and B. And so you use your statistical analysis to try and get a better understanding of the significant, uh, significant importance of uh, which particular cause has created each particular effect. Now, the book goes on to explain different types of experimental design. Now, ex experimental design basically is the design of your experiments and how you're going to do it. You take a certain number of people and you use them in different ways to try and work out their behavior and how they're operating, uh, what they're reacting to, and so on and so forth. And this particular book mentions three forms of experimental design. And there's a few different types out there. Firstly, there's repeated measure designs, in, and in this design, each subject performs in both the control and the experimental condition. 
Now the control is one in which basically you're not manipulating anything, you're not controlling the independent variable. Okay, so it's just a question of getting the result from the extraneous variables to create the um, the final dependent variable result basically. Alright, you, you're not controlling anything in the control. But the experimental conditions, when you put that extra one single factor into the, the experimental mix to see whether there is going to be a difference, and then you measure the, distance, the, the, the difference with real proper statistical analysis. Okay? So that's re repeated measure design. The independent subjects design, which is also quite interesting, in this design, some subjects perform in condition A and others in condition B. So it's different. So you've got your group, you split it in two, they both don't, they, they don't do the same thing. This one does this lot, this one does this lot, it's not sw swapped over. And finally, the match pair is designed. From the results of a pretest, the subjects are sorted into matched pairs, pairs of equal abilities on the task to be measured. One from each pair performs in the experimental condition and one in the control. And yes, there's a bit of a mention here as to the fact that there are downsides to the various different types of experimental conditions. There are advantages and disadvantages. And if you're going to call something a scientific experiment, you've got to make sure that you've chosen the right variety of experimental design, taking into account both the positives and the negatives. All right. So it says here, number one, as you can see, the independent subject's design is quite wasteful with subjects compared with repeated measures. So essentially you can have too, too many people, but there could be some problems with, with repeated measures as well. It depends upon the experiments. Number two, since the control group is the same as the experimental group in repeated measure design, this method automatically ensures that there are uh, no personality or ability differences between the groups. So that's okay. Three, in some experiments, performance in one condition pollutes the subject for use in another condition. Because, you know, you could get a certain quantity of training from doing something once. It says here, since he is no longer a naive subject, so if, you're, if you've been affected by it, you're, you're going to perform differently. Okay? This is often the case in learning experiments. For example, um, it would not be possible to use repeated measure design to investigate different methods of learning to drive a car. This is on page 31. Number four, match pairs design controls for personality and ability differences between conditions by the method of consistency and can be used in situations where repeated measure design is not possible. So that's got its own positives and negatives there, okay? The choice of characteristics to match in match pairs design is a subjective decision and pre-testing can take a long time. Independent subjects design is more commonly used situation where repeated measures is not appropriate. So again, you got to choose with care. So for the most part it will probably be independent subject style designs, even though um, that could actually be rather wasteful. So it'd be better to have a larger sample size than a small sample size. Okay. And yes, you just heard my cats just come in. Hmm. It says here, statistical tests can tell us about the likelihood of obtaining the results we that we that we get simply as a result of chance factors. So we're measuring chance and we're measuring the results of the bit that we've added into the whole equation. All right. And we measure this by level of significance. It says here levels of significance is normally taken at the 5% level of probability. This means that there is only a 5% or I think it's called 5 percentile probability that the results occurred due to chance. The difference is then said to be significant is if there is only a 5% or less probability that occurred due to chance. And in this book here, which is the other one I've got at hand, there's a very useful tables at the back, uh, which are the significance tables. And as you can see, there's lots of numbers there. You've got, and you said you choose numbers based upon your results, go down through the chart, find the value, and see how the value correlates with this actually the kind of result you're looking for to see whether it was significant or whether it wasn't significant. All right. What I haven't gone into in this particular video is the actual um, statistical tests themselves. And I might consider doing that in another video, I'm not sure. But for me to put out three videos today is actually quite a, quite a hell of a lot. Okay. But I just wanted to explain to you what the scientific method really is when we're dealing with social and psychological phenomena. 
Because if you don't understand that, you can't understand the complexity of what social research is about and psychological research is about. And you'll end up falling for um, you know a load of rubbish which is spouted by some kind of unpleasant individual. Okay? So I hope that's been helpful. It's just a brief overview of the scientific method. And I know it's being told to you by Nick Dutch and not by Thunderfoot. Which is quite fascinating in some strange, introspective kind of a way really, isn't it? <laughs>